This program is brought to you by Emory University. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I've done this for previous India summits in the past. So uh, basically, I, I'm going to summarize my talk in three lines to start with. When we started this whole program with diabetes and chronic disease at Emory uh, about eight years ago, seven to eight years ago, uh, we basically had no clue what we were going to do, number one. And now after eight, seven years, we've reached a stage where we don't, we have no clue at all what we are doing, okay? And if you ask me in five years' time, I'll tell you we had no clue what we did. So that's the, so that's, it's a very, for me, that's been a, a guiding principle when you do research, and I think it's a, it's a great thing to do. So when, when, it, when I came to Emory seven or eight years ago, I had done, already done 14 years of uh, fairly serious research in diabetes. So focusing on diabetes was a non-question. I mean, it was clearly, where my specialty lay and my strengths lay. And it was also a time when um, the growth of diabetes in the US was very high. And I was, I was part of various projection groups uh, that, were, that were forecasting that diabetes in India was going to be a major problem. So I've been part, my, I often joke, my grandfather's hobby was astrology. My, my hobby is forecasting. But you know, so what, regardless, so, so that was clear. So something is going to happen big in India in terms of diabetes. It's also a problem in the US. So it was a problem connecting two places, number one. Secondly, India was going to be a large growing economy, a very diverse country. And thirdly, I too have uh, personal connections with India. For all these reasons, focusing on India made sense. Focusing on diabetes made sense for me initially. Uh, so the first, uh, when we, so that was easy. The difficult part is, what sort of, a, how does one go about this? And, you know, in general, people tell you you need a plan, et cetera. And Bill Fagey, uh, whom you all know, uh, one, you know, uh, one day had a long conversation with me, and this was at the beginning, it was about my first three months at Emory, and he told me some, two or three very important things. He said, never have a plan, it never works. What you need is a good philosophy. And I think, so I, I kind of reflected on the idea, what sort of a philosophy should I use for this collaboration? And then when I read about how international health and international work happens, I came to two conclusions. I mean, largely, most of international work in the early part of the last century or whatever started largely by colonial organizations going out to do international health for their benefit. I mean, like, for example, the London School of Hygiene in, was set up to, to uh, solve malaria and, and dysentery problems in uh, British soldiers and British civil servants. And that tendency also continued towards kind of exploitation, okay? It's easy place to recruit populations, let's do research, et cetera. That was kind of the first phase of globalization of research. The second phase was pretty much slightly humanitarian, but also very missionary oriented. It was kind of saying, oh, we need to do something good for the poor people. Okay. So it started with the idea, let's do good. And I am always skeptical about that philosophy, too. It's a very patronizing philosophy. It starts off saying we want to do good, and people end up doing well rather than doing good. So, you know, so that's my kind of quip about it. So I, I wanted to avoid both those uh, pitfalls. So, so when I honestly asked the question, and this was when I read uh, Thomas Friedman's uh, book, The Earth is Flat, the, you know, et cetera. So I began to feel maybe here is how I, we should pitch it. Uh, that global research in today's age should have mutual benefit. So not only does India benefit, but the U.S. benefits from it. So, and what can that be? I mean, clearly, it had to be in an area where there was a common disease, a common problem, and intriguing scientific questions that cannot be answered by doing a study in one place, but you needed to do in, in several places. So that was number one. And secondly, also the optimization of skill development. I mean, clearly, uh, Rama is right. When it comes to grants writing, paper writing, et cetera, India was still at an early stage. But on the other hand, there were, there were greater skills there when it came to field studies, et cetera. So how do we combine the skills was my second thing. So with all that, we started, we, we looked at various partners. And again, in terms of selection of partners, it, it boils down to where you have good personal chemistry. I think that's very, very important. And uh, we scouted. We identified five or six potential partners. We honed in on the Madras Diabetes Research Foundation in Chennai, and we set up a memorandum of agreement with Emory University to start a global diabetes research center. And luckily, within about six to eight months, we started getting one or two grants, and also the NIH and United Health Group announced an RFA 
to fund centers of excellence worldwide. So they wanted to fund nine centers of excellence as partnerships between the US or a developing co developed country and a developing country. So we bid for that. And at that point, again, you can't be stuck to a partner. So to win that grant, that grant was about not just about diabetes, but it was about non-communicable disease in general. So we found, it, we felt it was strategic to widen the partnership. So we went with Madras Diabetes Research Foundation, but also with the Public Health Foundation of India, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi, and the Aga Khan University in Karachi. So we won that grant. So that, that gave us several million dollars uh, to set up a center, which it became a virtual center, it was headquartered in Delhi. So it had three functions, uh, building up surveillance. So we established a cohort study, uh, which currently was, uh, at that time, was 17,000 people sampled from Chennai, Delhi, and Karachi. But since then, it's now expanding to 50,000 people across the, the subcontinent. Uh, and the first 17,000 have been followed up annually every year for the last three years. And uh, soon we'll have a, a study of the magnitude of, I don't know, a very large international cohort, 50,000 people, and all biospecimens uh, you know, sampled away, stored away. So it becomes a huge repository for large population-based study. The second uh, major thing that we used the grant for was to set up infrastructure for large clinical trials. And we are much more interested in um, clinical trials aimed at implementing what is already known. So we have a trial ongoing, uh, which is implementing diabetes prevention in Chennai. We have another trial in 11 centers across India and Pakistan, which is implementing uh, standards of care for diabetes and looking at outcomes in terms of reduction in cardiovascular disease, et cetera. And these trials help also to improve the care system in the, in the, in the country. And the third major focus was training. And even in training, we took a two-way street. We said, this is going to, there's going to be opportunities to train Indian uh, investigators, but simultaneously also offer opportunities for US investigators. And over the last seven years, we have probably successfully trained, we can, we, you know, do, difficult to count the number, 70 to 80 investigators, PhD and postdoctoral fellows. Uh, and we've had at least 20, 22 US investigators spend about a year in India or more. Several have got their PhDs out of it. Several have become uh, you know, tenured faculty with that work, et cetera. So that kind of opportunity has arisen now for them. Uh, and simultaneously, to support this, uh, this kind of work, we also had to grow, grow the group here. So I started as one faculty myself, and now we are actually, the Emory Global Diabetes Research Center is nine full-time faculty, uh, funded through a variety of mechanisms. It's uh, both tenure track and also non-tenure track, and funding from different sources. And plus, we have large numbers of doctoral students and postdoctoral fellows, administrative staff, et cetera. And so we have a very large team here, but we also have about 140 people in Delhi, uh, about 20 people in Chennai, about 10 or, 20, 10 or 12 people in, in Karachi, and the field sites in India. So you add it all together, it's probably 180, 200 people. And again, another revolution has happened. So as we were working with India, so were many, many uh, un universities across the US and, and globally. And the one prominent one, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, had a strong connection with the Public Health Foundation of India. So they floated the idea of setting up a, a, a global chronic disease center in New Delhi. And this is when we said, okay, you want to set up a chronic disease center, that's what we have been doing, why don't we come together? So we spent a year and a half basically to overcome the psychological barriers to collaboration. I mean, it's, there is, I mean, there, there are transatlantic barriers here. So finally, we ended up signing a memorandum of agreement, uh, and which in fact next month, uh, 7th of, uh, 8th of April, is going to be the launch of the center, and Jim Curran and others are traveling to India. And it's going, again, naming of the center became a big problem. What do you call it? So finally, people have arrived at, it's going to be called four C's, Center for Control of Chronic Conditions. But it's going to be diabetes, cardiovascular disease, mental health, cancers, injuries, et cetera. And the idea here is, and then these are, so the four institutions involved in the center are going to be Public Health Foundation of India, the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi, Emory University, and London School of Hygiene. We are the four core partners, and we're all pitching in. Emory is going to pitch in roughly about $300,000 a year over three years. So was London School of Hygiene. And most of our pitching in is really to support our faculty and our staff here. And then there are other organizations like Harvard, uh, Northwestern, 
uh, you know, Mount Sinai, et cetera, many other schools involved in some other capacity. So they become part of the network partner. So it's becoming a global organization now. So it's been a, a great journey so far. And in terms of, I want to give you two examples of what kind of scientific opportunities there are from doing these global studies, okay? Uh, very clearly, I worked with the Pima Indians in Arizona many, many years ago. And the Pima Indians in Arizona are a Native American tribe. And in the 1960s, the, the NIH was doing a survey of rheumatoid arthritis in the Pima Indians, okay? Because it was thought that rheumatoid arthritis was very common in, in desert populations. And in the process, they accidentally discovered that 50% of the population in 1963 had diabetes. So this was a shocker because most countries have diabetes prevalence of 2 to 3%. And here were the Pima, Pima Indians with 50% by age 45. So suddenly it was believed to be a, a Pima problem. And so the theory that came out of it was uh, this was a population that had moved from fairly subsistence living suddenly into modern kind of living, uh, not to forget the building of the Roosevelt Dam that uh, pretty much uh, destroyed their local agriculture, et cetera. So within a matter of 30 years, they developed huge levels of diabetes. So the idea was the population was genetically susceptible to diabetes. And when they were suddenly exposed to ample food supply, poor physical activity, uh, the insulin that the body produces was not acting well. So the term insulin resistance was coined. So, but what, was, what people did not realize was what was happening in the Pima Indians was anticipating what is going to happen in the rest of the world, the US included. So today, we, we talk of diabetes as a pandemic. It's affecting all countries of the world. It's affecting rich countries, poor countries, rural areas, urban areas. It's spreading everywhere. But mysteriously, uh, in India, when you look at the average Indian, particularly 10 years ago, he was thinner or she was thinner compared to the Pima Indian. So, but why is there high rates of diabetes in India? In Chennai, they've seen the prevalence go from 2.5% in 1971 to about 20% now. Huge increase. So what's happening? So we said, why don't we compare the Pima Indians, which, was one, which gave the world the theory of what might be causing diabetes, with the Chennai Indians? So we took 1,000 Pima Indians and we compared them with 3,600 Chennai Indians and we found some striking results. First, by age 50, the Chennai Indians also had 50% developing diabetes by age 50, as high as the Pima Indians, number one. That's shocking. But the Chennai Indians were seven BMI units lighter. So, they, so obesity alone was not contributing to it. Something else was contributing to it. So then we said, Let's measure insulin action. The Pima Indians were four and a half times poorer in their ability for the insulin to act. So insulin action as a primary problem, although it might be a contributor, was not sufficient to explain diabetes in India. So we measured insulin secretion, uh, the functioning of the beta cells of the pancreas, and we found something very dramatic last year that the, the Indians in India also have poorer secretory capacity of the beta cells of the pancreas when it comes to producing insulin. So they have two problems. Number one, they have poorer insulin secretion, and two, they have poorer insulin action. So most of the world's research is focused on insulin action, not so much on insulin secretion. So this has given us new foray to move big time into what is the problem, what is causing, what's causing damage to the beta cells, uh, whether it is function or mass or whatever. So that's where we are at the moment. So that opportunity, I don't think we could have got uh, without, uh, and, and what is happening in India might probably be happening in the uh, rest of Asia, in Africa, et cetera. So my own theory is, uh, when you talk of diabetes, the countries that, have, that missed 200 years of industrialization, those populations are having a new phenotype, which probably is driven by centuries of malnutrition, undernutrition, whatever. So their organs have been damaged, including the beta cell of the pancreas, and now when they're suddenly exposed, not only do they have the same uh, environmental challenge, but they have less compensatory ability. So I think this might be where. So what we had thought of as a problem of undernutrition may also be a problem of overnutrition. The two get connected. So but we, we, we could not have discovered this without you know, going out to do, to do work in India. So I'll stop there. And before I conclude in terms of what have I learned from this, firstly, like Bill Fagey told me, before you start with your partner, define the final mile. That is very important, very, very important. So we, this is what we want to do. And believe me, that final mile might, might change. 
Uh, and your journey to the final mile may not be exactly what you think. It might be very different. And I, the analogy I use is sailing. When you're sailing, you know you want to get there, but the wind velocity will dis decide how you get there. You know, you've got to tack and go there. So that's what it is, number one. Second, identify mutual benefits that are useful. Without that, it becomes a difficult relationship, whereas if it's mutual benefit, it becomes a very respectful two-way relationship. That's extremely important. It's very naive to believe that, oh, in the US, we have all the technical know-hows and we can go and teach people elsewhere. That doesn't work. That actually is counterproductive. You go in with the spirit of teaching and learning, a lot of things work. Thirdly, it is important to, for conversation to continue. There will be times when there'll be conflicts. Don't avoid conflicts, manage them. Bring it out, bring it out, healthy dissent, discuss, argue. So, and we do this all the time. So we have a culture of uh, all our students and fellows and students and fellows in India interacting, jokes being shared, et cetera. So it becomes, it's almost virtual where they are and where we are. And finally, you know, again, this idea of planning too much ahead doesn't work, I think. What really works, in my opinion, you need to bring three things together. You need to bring good ideas, good people, and resources together. Where you start from doesn't matter. Sometimes you start with an idea and you go after resources. Sometimes you start with a good person, like a good doctoral student with an idea, and you go after uh, you know, uh, resources. And, but you have to connect the three things. So I think that's been the thing, and it really works. And uh, I am very excited with what we have done. Thank you.